Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Patricia Torres Bird, and I'm the managing director of Houston PBS. Channel 8 is the very first educational television station in the country, and we are licensed to the University of Houston and supported through the Association for Community Broadcasting. We are delighted and honored to be collaborating with Rice University and the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy to present tonight's program featuring former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. <clears throat> In 2009, Houston PBS had the distinct honor of working with Secretary Rice along with President George H. W. Bush and Secretary of State, excuse me, Secretary of State James Baker while filming our national award-winning PBS documentaries, A, War, A Wall, The World Divided, and After the Wall, A World United, which chronicled the rise and fall of the Berlin Wall. It was a great honor then, as it is now, to have you here with us today and to have Dr. Rice in Houston tonight. An event like this is only possible with great sponsors and partners. As part of our mission to empower and engage and enrich the lives of the people of Southeast Texas, we present the Houston PBS Elevate Lecture Series, which is generally, generously sponsored by the John P. McGovern Foundation. The McGovern Foundation is truly one of our city's great institution, and we appreciate their generosity, and most of all, their very true friendship. I'd like to thank, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Secretary James Baker and Ambassador Edward Deragian for making this evening possible. The stellar work and the reputation of the Baker Institute benefit our entire city, and I'm sure you will agree, the world. And to our members and viewers, thank you for your support. Over 85% of our $9 million operating budget comes from the community we serve, with the majority of that coming from ind individual donors such as you. We are grateful for the trust you place in us and deliver quality, educational, and informative and entertaining programming for the young and the young at heart. It is now my distinct honor to welcome Ambassador Deridian to the stage. Thank you very much, Patricia. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight, Houston PBS and the Baker Institute are privileged to host an in-depth conversation with one of our nation's most distinguished public servants. And we are fortunate to have Ernie Manus, one of the region's best and well-liked journalists, to facil facilitate what I expect to be a very edifying discussion. This evening's special guest first gained prominence as President George Herbert Walker Bush's advisor for Soviet affairs. This was, needless to say, an immensely important position during a period marked by the collapse of the Soviet empire. But our speaker truly came into her own during the administration of President George W. Bush, serving as national security advisor from 2001 to 2005 and as Secretary of State from 2005 to 2009. She describes those years in her vivid new memoir, No Higher Honor. I don't have to tell anyone in this audience that it was one of the most tumultuous periods in American history. Her time as National Security Advisor and Secretary of State was marked by the attacks of September 11, 2001, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, turmoil in the Middle East and elsewhere, and at the end of her tenure, the onset of the largest financial crisis since the Great Depression. On a personal note, I had the privilege of working with her and <clears throat> under Secretary of State Karen Hughes on our public diplomacy toward the Arab and Muslim world, and she made a real contribution to enhancing our nation's ability to reach out to this very important part of the world. Throughout all these dramatic years and events, our speaker kept her cool, even more importantly, her eye on the prize. For if there's one quality that characterizes her above all others, 
It is an absolute commitment to promoting our country's interests and values. She is, in other words, a true and dedicated public servant. But of course, our speaker is much more. She is a first-rate scholar who has served as provost of Stanford University. She has certainly bridged the gap between the world of ideas and the world of action as a scholar and public policy practitioner. This is exactly what the Baker Institute is about, is bringing the world of ideas and the world of action together. She is also a gifted musician who originally majored in the piano. She is an individual who are by her background and rise to prominence in many ways embodies the American dream and makes us all proud of being Americans. She's also a fan of the Baker Institute, which she visited three years ago when we celebrated our 15th anniversary. So, ladies and gentlemen, Madam Secretary, I am very pleased to tell you that we have several hundred students from Rice University and University of Houston and other universities here in Houston who have come to hear you this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Condoleezza Rice, the 66th Secretary of State of the United States of America, and Ernie Manus. I'll give him a second to finish. <laughs> Let's start off with the question that I'm, I'm kind of curious. If you had a chance to have served as Secretary of State at any other point through our country's history, when would that have been? Well, other than at the founding of the country, uh, when Thomas Jefferson fought the Barbary Pirates, I think that uh, I would love to have served uh, at the time of uh, my great heroes, uh, George Marshall and Dean Acheson, uh, because I believe that that was the time when critical choices were made to really engage the United States in a permanent way in the affairs of the world. Uh, before that, the United States had occasionally gone to war, as in World War I, but always come home uh, to isolation. But uh, Atchison and Marshall and Truman and others made a different choice. And when I was serving in the White House in uh, 1989 to 1991, and, and as uh, my good friend uh, Ed Ridgen said, I was the White House specialist at the end of the, the Cold War, and frankly, it doesn't get better than that. <laughs> but I had to remember that the really good decisions that led to the victory in the Cold War had been taken in 46 and 47 and 48. And so uh, that's the period that I most admire in American diplomacy. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take you all the way back. And I'm curious about your education and how it prepared you for the world view that you had when you came into prominence. I grew up in a family of educators, and uh, I, I wrote another book about my parents uh, called Extraordinary Ordinary People because in many ways they were ordinary people. My mother was a school teacher, my father was a high school football coach and a, a Presbyterian minister and a high school guidance counselor. And uh, they, I think, between them, never made $60,000 in their entire lives. But for me, uh, when, when they were dealing with me, nothing that could even remotely be called an educational opportunity was denied to me. And so I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama, with a sense of limitless horizons. They always taught uh, that you might not be able to control your circumstances, but you can control your response to your circumstances. And so I grew up with this sense uh, that almost nothing was impossible. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's extremely important to carry that kind of optimism into uh, government service, particularly if you happen to be in the White House or in the State Department in times of trials and tribulations. You have to constantly draw on that sense of the possible uh, and recognize that you can get through whatever is there, that what seems impossible at the time seems inevitable in retrospect, mm -hmm. and it really helps you to get through uh, difficult times. How do you get other parents, though, to realize that they need to do that with their children? Well, every child needs an advocate. Um, mm -hmm. I was fortunate that my parents were very special, and I thank God every single night that I had the parents that I did, because great parents are a head start in life. But if a child isn't fortunate enough to have those parents, then there has to be somebody to advocate for that child. Maybe it's a community leader, maybe it's a minister, maybe it's a teacher. Um, and I think that it is having a sense of high expectations for children, because children will either live 
up to high expectations or down to low expectations. And sometimes I think in an effort to give kids self-esteem, we underestimate the importance of high expectations. My parents were also not necessarily modern parents. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was going to be a, a pianist. I could read music before I could read. I was three years old when I started to play the piano. And when I was about 10, I said to my mother, I'm tired of piano. I'm going to quit. And my mother said, you're not old enough or good enough to make that decision. <laughs> and um, as a result, I kept playing, and that's why I can play today. And so um, I think with, with children, it's limitless horizons, but recognizing that you have to have high expectations for them, and they have to learn to have high expectations for themselves. Can the education system help with that, or does this have to be from the family? Oh, no, the education system can most certainly help. Um, I, look, I think the, the greatest single national security threat that we have right now is the crisis in K-12 education. Because if I can look at your... If, if I can look at your zip code, and I can look at your zip code and tell whether or not you're going to get a good education, we've lost something that's very critical because the United States of America is not, um, Americans are not united by blood or ethnicity or religion. We are united by the proposition that it doesn't matter where you came from, it matters where you're going. You can come from humble circumstances, you can do great things, but if you can't have a high quality education, then that's simply not true. And that will tear us apart because we will have people who are unable to get jobs, they'll be unemployable. They will live on the dole because there will be nothing else for them to do. Do you know that today only 30% of the people who take the basic skills test to get into the military can pass it? And so we are really at risk in this area. Now, how do we do that? Great teachers, I've known a lot of fantastic teachers, great teachers, great expectations of kids. I'm not one for the self-esteem movement, as you've probably <laughs> noticed. Uh, a few years ago, I was helping my, my cousin's daughter with her homework, and she said, she had nine times five is 40. And I said, oh, that's a wrong answer. And she said, there are no wrong answers. And I said, um, yeah, there are, and that would be one of them. And uh, so I think high expectations, you know, don't get me started. If kids are gonna do one of those little performances, don't say, oh, how cute that they're trying. No, actually let them practice, and then it will be better for them and better for the audience. So I think that uh, <laughs> high expectations uh, matter, and the schools can set, yeah. the teachers can set high expectations. Okay, then when did the political bug bite you? Well, it really never did, to be so fair. So you're really not no, interested in politics. No, I really am not. Uh, the, <laughs> the bug that bit me was uh, the chance to serve um, first President George H.W. Bush uh, through Brent Scowcroft, one of my mentors, um, in an area that I cared about and that I was passionate about. I'd become a Soviet specialist um, after being a failed piano major. Fortunately, <laughs> I'd found uh, the study of the Soviet Union and things international. And then to serve uh, then Governor George, a uh, George W. Bush and helping him to put together his foreign policy to decide what direction he was going to take. Um, I'm a policy person. I love policy. But public service has to be, of course, the marriage of policy and politics. You can't say, oh, I won't get involved in the political system, but I will do policy. You can do policy outside the political system and have very little impact, or you can roll up your sleeves, get in there, do battle with everybody else, try to make good policy decisions, and then go home and do something else. Yeah. And that's what I have done. But I'm going to take you a little bit back because you say you got into it with the Bush administration. But actually, the Carter administration was yes. where you first served. Well, that was, no, I didn't. Well, that was where I first licked envelopes in a campaign. <laughs> um, look, I, I came out of, um, as I said, out of the study of music. And the first time that I could vote for president was actually 1976. And um, I'm a daughter of the South. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama. And so I saw President Carter, Jimmy Carter, Governor Carter, as the reconciliation of North and South. And I was very excited, and I worked for him. And um, I proudly then voted for him. But I was also a Soviet specialist. And in 1979, when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, and our response was, 
to boycott the Olympics. I thought, this is a real problem. We need new leadership on foreign policy. And uh, I was attracted to Ronald Reagan at that point. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> You're getting some applause on that <laughs> one. Uh, which makes me wonder, too, when you talk about that, the difference between a politician and a party. Where does the allegiance fall for you? Oh, certainly, uh, the allegiance falls first and foremost to my country and to good leadership for it. Um, I happen to, uh, I came into the Republican Party because of my foreign policy views. I'm a national security hawk in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, I believe strongly in American exceptionalism, that America has a special role to play in the world. I believe in free markets and free peoples as the basis of a sound foreign policy and ultimately a more peaceful world. Uh, and so I, find, I found my home uh, in the Republican Party. I find that I also am uh, a small government person. Um, I believe uh, strongly in fiscal responsibility, the private sector. Uh, it's not that I don't think the federal government has a role. It does. But, uh, you know, the private sector is uh, creative and innovative and risk-taking. Um, I spent eight years in Washington, um, not so much uh, innovative and creative and risk-taking. <laughs> and so uh, my tendency toward private sector-led growth uh, probably puts me in that camp. But just like any other American, I want people who are going to lead us, people who are going to tell us the truth, uh, people who are not going to coddle us, uh, people who are not going to play to our worst fears, but play to our greatest sense of optimism. And so I look for that in any candidate. When you were serving, there had to be points where you didn't agree 100% with policy and what was shared. How do you reconcile that within yourself, and how do you know when you tow the line and when you speak up and put your own views out? Well, it's absolutely true that you can't possibly agree with, with everything, and I think there are a couple of ways that you handle it. First of all, if it's something that crosses into the realm of uh, your integrity or crosses into the realm of uh, putting aside your values, then you shouldn't do it, and you have an obligation to resign. I never faced that decision. I did face dis uh, decisions where I was not in agreement with the direction that we were taking, and uh, it was my responsibility to go to the president and tell him that I would uh, go another way, but to recognize that, after all, he was the one who had been elected president, not me. And so uh, if I felt that I had made my case uh, to him, I understood what he was going to do, uh, and I could support it. I then uh, carried out those, those duties. Is there ever a moment, and I'm sure there must be for some folks in your position, where you question, do I stand up or risk the chance of walking away from this job? And I wonder, that must be all over Washington. It's such a beast up there. I, I think it is, but I don't ever remember, um, well, I remember one case, and I did actually talk about it in the book. Um, it was not actually a policy difference, but um, I was the national security advisor. The national security advisor is the honest broker, the coordinator of foreign policy. I once told President Bush it's a little bit like trying to make uh, foreign policy by remote control. You know, I'll try to get Secretary A to do this and Secretary B to do that. Because as the national security advisor, you don't own troops like the Secretary of Defense. You don't own uh, diplomats like the Secretary of State. You're not in charge of the money supply, like, uh, or uh, not the money supply, but the U.S. Treasury, like the Secretary of the Treasury. And so uh, you, you really are coordinating, and your authority derives really only from the President, which is something, of course, that you can't use too often. You can't constantly say, oh, well, the President wants it. <laughs> or pretty soon, your colleagues start to resent it. So it's, in some ways, a powerful position and in some ways a weaker position because you are staff, rarefied staff, but you're staff. The one thing you really have to do is ensure that the president is hearing all voices. That's your first obligation as national security advisor. And in this case, um, because of some things that had happened between the Office of Legal Counsel, a couple of people in the vice president's office, um, a, an order on military commissions got to the president's desk, and he signed it before I saw it. And it meant that I didn't see it. It meant that Colin Powell didn't see it. It meant that John Ashcroft, the attorney general, had had minimal time to see it. 
And that's the only time that I actually went to the president and said, Mr. President, if that happens again, somebody's going to have to resign. Either they resign or I do. That's the only time, and it never happened again. How was the president when things like that would come up? We, we had a very close relationship and a relationship of trust. And so you learn how important that is when things are hard. Because I always felt that I could go to the president and tell him absolutely anything. I could even be critical of things that he'd said. But never, you'd never do it with anybody else in the room. Uh, you especially don't do it in a way that it might end up in the New York Times, because why would he trust you if, you know, if you're leaking to the New York Times? But I felt that our relationship was such that I could tell him uh, whatever I was thinking. I remember another time, it's also in the book, when you remember the famous um, bring it on and, you know, Osama bin Laden dead or alive and so forth. And so we came back uh, into the Oval Office and, and uh, he said, um, so, what did you think of that? And I said, you know, a little white hot for the President of the United States to say that. And he said, yeah, Laura's going to agree with that. And so, um, <laughs> you know, I felt I could be honest with him, which is what I owed him. How long did it take to build that kind of trust, though? We had been together uh, since the end of 1998 when he began to consider a run for the presidency. We met at Kennebunkport. President George H.W. Bush had invited me to Kennebunkport. He said, you know, my son, the governor of Texas, he's thinking about running for president. I want you to come talk to him about foreign policy. So we actually spent uh, a nice weekend um, out on the boat. He'd fish. I'd talk about China. Um, on the uh, <laughs> running on the treadmill, we'd both run. I'd talk about Russia. Um, you know, so we spent a, a while together then. And then we established um, a relationship. I put together his foreign policy team. It's kind of fun to do a campaign at the beginning because, uh, you know, you, you schlep your own luggage and you go into these sites, you know, sometimes we'd go to a, a cowboy bar for a, uh, a little event and there'd be 10 people there and you think, hmm, is this campaign really going anywhere or not? <laughs> and so those early experiences, that's really when you build the trust. And uh, by the time you get to the Oval Office, I think you want people in whom you can have that kind of trust. Because I'll tell you something, when the president is in the Oval Office, oh yes, Mr. President, you're so brilliant, Mr. President. Everything you do is brilliant, Mr. President, because the Oval Office is intimidating to people. And it's extremely important to have people by your side who are not intimidated by the office, who respect the office, who respect that you're the elected one, but who will tell you the truth. Which is interesting that you put it like that, because so many people refer to you as a politician, yeah. where you are not a politician. No, I'm not a politician. Never ran for student government. Either. Never even did that? No, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the Oval Office, first time you walked into the Oval Office, yeah. do you remember it, and what was the reaction? Oh, I remember very well my first time in the Oval Office. I was there to be the note taker in a meeting. It was early February, so we'd just been in, in office a little bit uh, between President George H.W. Bush and our ambassador, the U.S. ambassador to the Soviet Union, who was coming back to report on what, by 1989, were already uh, monumental events taking place. And I was sitting in the Oval Office, and um, I was looking around and thinking, wow, this is the Oval Office. And we were about two-thirds through the meeting, and I thought, I have not taken a single note. <laughs> <laughs> and um, at that point, I thought, you know, you're not here for the ride. All right? <laughs> but that was my first experience in the Oval Office. But I watched so many people in the Oval Office just overwhelmed by it. It's, yeah. it's beautiful. It's small. It befits a republic, not an empire. I watched Vladimir Putin, uh, as president of Russia, walk into the Oval Office for the first time, and he looked around, and he said, it's so beautiful. This kind of hardened former KGB officer, and that's what he said. Uh, you could see it had even an effect on him. Yeah. You, you talk about world leaders, and you've met pretty much all of them at some point or other. Are they as they are represented in the press? Do you find that our general concept of these leaders is accurate? Well, there's a grain of truth in most of the, uh, most of the uh, ways that people think about them, but it's not all uh, that way. For instance, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, the president of France, 
is a bit of a whirling dervish. I mean, he's, you know, very active and energetic. But he's also one of the most thoughtful leaders that you will ever meet, particularly when it comes to issues of values and the importance of freedom um, in the world. And so uh, a little bit of the characterization is true, but there's something uh, much, much deeper there. Uh, Putin is somebody who kind of is, as he comes across, very tough, <laughs> you know, really uh, almost uh, intimidating in some ways. Um, I remember, again, it's in, again in the book, I, I went to uh, Russia in 2007 there were sort of storm clouds already between Georgia and Russia, which would explode, of course, in war in 2008. And I went to visit uh, Putin, and we were sitting sort of like this, but he was turned a little bit more toward me. And I said, you know, Mr. President, President Bush asked me to come and say that if anything happens between Georgia and Russia, it's going to have a huge effect on U.S.-Russian relations. And he stood up, and he glared over me in a kind of you know, posture meant to intimidate. And so I reflexively stood up too. <laughs> and, um, you know, I'm five foot eleven in my heels, so it was uh, not exactly eye to eye either. And it was uh, one of those moments when your reflex takes over and your reflex is don't try to intimidate me. And so uh, some leaders um, are kind of what you see is what you get. Yeah. yeah. When you mention that, I wonder. Being a woman in that position, I think it's more of an issue for those of us in America or the U.S. than in other countries. Did you find yeah. that to be true? Well, it depended. Um, first of all, when you're Secretary of State, you're Secretary of State, and they really don't want to make the Secretary of State mad by somehow, <laughs> you know, in yeah. some way uh, making you angry. And so, actually, um, I found most of the time that it was a little bit of an advantage, for instance, in the Middle East. Uh, which may surprise you, uh, but I can remember going to, to meet a very, very conservative Shia cleric. He couldn't touch me because I was a woman, so he should, couldn't shake my hand. But at the end of our meeting, he said, uh, you know, I'd really like you to meet my 13-year-old granddaughter. He said, she really likes you. He's saying this all in Arabic. It's being translated. Would you send her a note and, and meet her when she comes to the United States? So. When she and her mother came, you know, here bounded out this little girl, um, and she said, I want to be foreign minister too. And, you know, when her grandfather spoke about her, he just beamed. And I thought, well, maybe in seeing something different for his granddaughter, there's a little glimmer of hope here. And so I think that in some ways, going to see the Kuwaiti women who had participated in their first election and sent me a T-shirt that said, half a democracy is no democracy at all. In the Middle East, sometimes it was a good thing to be able to show, to model, that uh, a woman could do uh, these things. And, and inside the United States, uh, I was saying to some of the young students, uh, some of the students earlier, you know, when you're younger and you're in an all-male field, um, it can be a little bit tough. People will say things that are a little bit uh, derogatory. They'll treat you uh, a little bit uh, derisively. And you have to learn how to handle yourself. You have to be ultra prepared. My mother used to say, in terms of race, you have to be twice as good. All of that's true. You need mentors who will help you navigate. But you know, if by the time you're Secretary of State, you let somebody treat you badly because you're a woman, it's your fault, not theirs. Do You've you got ever... plenty of arsenal to deal with that. <laughs> But do you ever get to the point, and it sounds like a dumb question, but where you forget you are a woman, where you forget you are African American, yeah. where you are just the Secretary of State? Well, it's, after a while, you know, it's so integral being to you, being female and black, and you can't kind of go back and create yourself as white and male and see how it would turn out differently. <laughs> so uh, generally, um, I don't think about it uh, a, a great deal. I didn't think about it a great deal as Secretary of State. Uh, most of the time, that was a, was a good thing. Uh, once in a while, I would walk into a room in the State Department, and I would think, you know, we were in some meeting, I would think, there is nobody else in this room that looks like me, and that's a problem. <laughs> because it means that the Foreign Service is not diverse enough to represent a country that is the world's greatest multi-ethnic democracy. Okay. And so there would be times that it would flash like that, 
And there's one time that it got me in trouble not thinking about it. Um, during Katrina, um, I had been on the road since the moment after the State of the Union in 2005. I just wanted to go on vacation to New York to shoe shop and go to see Spamalot with my friends. I had exactly three days worth of vacation uh, that, that year. And this storm was approaching and we knew it was going to be bad and so I went to the Homeland Security National Security Council meeting. I worked with our people. We had a big passport office in New Orleans so I worked to make sure that our people were going to be safe, that we could transfer our uh, operations to uh, actually several to Houston and some to Charleston. And I made an, uh, a way for us to accept foreign donations because the United States of America shouldn't look arrogant at a time like that. Mm -hmm. Afghanistan sent us $100,000 for Katrina. And the first impulse was, oh, well, we don't need their aid. Well, you can't say that. You, of course, have to accept it. So I put all of that in place. Then I went off to New York City. And the next day, um, I, I'm watching this unfold, and I'm thinking, this is a tragedy, and it's got an undeniably black face. And what am I doing in New York? Mm -hmm. And I called the president, and I said, I'm going to come home. And he said, yeah, do that. And he had been so insistent that I go and get some rest that I knew it was a problem. And I, from that time on, I thought, how could you have been so dumb? You know, not only were you one of the presidents, are you one of the president's closest advisors at this time of national tragedy, what are you doing going to a show in New York? But you're also the highest ranking African American official in the administration. What are you doing when we have this problem uh, with race? And so um, that was a time that I wish I'd thought a little bit more about it. Do you spend a lot of time reflecting back on things and how they could have been or should have been? I mean, so many of the things you are in, people know about and hear yes. about for years yes. afterwards. Yes. Is there a lot of that armchair jockeying? Not really. I, you know, writing this book, you have to do some of it, right? Because people want to know, well, what did you think about this or that? And, and would you have done it differently? But I'm very much somebody who looks forward in, in large part because um, I know that today's headlines and history's judgment are rarely the same. And I know that history's judgment is a ways off still. Um, I often reflect on when I was in the White House the last time as the White House Soviet specialist. And I've said those are the people that I admired most, Truman and, and Atchison. And I would say to my uh, folks in the State Department when you know we were going through some times that were just really tough, I would say, you know, what would you say if I asked you what was it like to come to work in this building in 1946 when the Italian communist won 48 percent of the vote and the Italian and the French communist 46 percent of the vote? The question wasn't would Eastern Europe be communist, it was would Western Europe fall? The Marshall Plan that saved two million starving Europeans, the Berlin crisis, the fall of Czechoslovakia. In 1949 the Soviet Union explodes a nuclear weapon five years ahead of schedule. The Chinese communists win and in 1950, the Korean War breaks out. Now, if I had said to you then, let me tell you what's going to happen. In 1989, the Berlin Wall is going to come down for the last time. Germany will be unified in 1990, totally and completely on Western terms. West Germany will become the Federal Republic of Germany. It will become and remain a member of NATO. And on December 25th, the hammer and sickle is going to come down from the Kremlin for the last time. 75 years of communism, never mind. And oh, by the way, in 2006, an American president is going to go to a NATO summit in Latvia. Now, if I told you that at the beginning of this big historical epoch in 46 and 47, you would have had me committed for saying it. So if you're at the beginning of an historical epoch, as we were with 9-11 and all that it brought, don't try to judge what might look good 30 or 40 years down the road. Be prepared to let history judge. Yeah. And I'm going to be prepared to let all of you actually ask <laughs> questions. Well, not all of you, but we have some mics set up. There are two down in this area, and then there are three at the bottom of each staircase. So if you want to make your way there to ask some questions, we're going to open it up to a few questions from the audience. And while you do that, I want to ask you about a couple of other things. Yes. Um, okay, there's an oil, there was an oil tanker named after you. Yes. 
There was. There was. And in Texas, that's a good thing, right? Yeah. In Houston? <laughs> um, actually, um, I, I was a Chevron director. And uh, Chevron named at the time its uh, tankers uh, after its board members. So I, there was a Condoleezza Rice. But when I went into the White House, and actually before 9-11, we decided that a Condoleezza Rice steaming into ports in various parts of the world uh, was probably <laughs> not a great idea. Yeah. And after 9-11, I was really glad that uh, yeah. we had renamed it something else. So it is no more, but I have the model and I keep it, and it was a great moment. <laughs> and in pop culture, they have you dating, or did date, the uh, head of NBC on 30 Rock. You That's dated right. Jack Donahue. I did. I did. Apparently, he broke up with me by text message. Um, <laughs> you plus me yeah, equals frowny right. face. That's exactly yeah. right. And I did uh, actually go and, and have a chance to uh, cameo on 30 Rock, which was a lot of fun. Loved Tina Fey, who is really funny, and uh, also Alec Baldwin, who was, who was great. And um, the, the best part about uh, that whole thing uh, was that I think I got more emails about that than anything <laughs> else I've ever done. <laughs> does it ever surprise you how many people know you? Yes, that does still surprise me. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, I, I still think of myself as uh, somebody who uh, went to school in Birmingham, Alabama, then on to Denver, the university professor, and. Uh, took a little detour to work in Washington. And yeah, so, yes, it surprises detour. me sometimes. Yeah. Well, we're going to open it up and see questions. I'm going to start right over here with this gentleman. You can step up to the mic, say your name, and ask your question. Um, my name is James Williams, and I'd like to thank you for coming, Ms. Rice. Um, and you were great on 30 Rock, by the way. <laughs> and uh, it's actually a two-part question. Uh, you look absolutely stunning tonight. Thank and, you. Um, before this is all said and done with, my friends will never believe me I, that I heard you speak unless I get a picture. Uh, you can think about that while I ask this. Um, I lived in St. Petersburg, Russia from 2008 to 2011. Um, my first year I was kind of, I studied Russian for three years in college. Um, and I was kind of there that first year learning more of the language, getting it down. But my second year in Russia, um, I got the impression that the U.S. policy towards Russia is still Soviet policy. Mm and we still have a Soviet approach to how we deal with Russia, the Russian Federation, which is not the Soviet Union anymore at all. Right. And I think um, I actually have a policy memo that I typed if you want to send it to someone in D.C. Why, why don't you um, send it to me? Uh, <laughs> I can't but, do anything about it now, but you okay. can send it to me. Sorry. But in all seriousness, I think that there needs to be something done with how we deal with the Russian Federation and how we deal with Putin because they're not Soviets anymore. They see no. themselves as Russians. Absolutely. No, it's a very, it's an excellent point, and um, I think the Russian people in particular uh, have left the Soviet period behind. You know, actually, we had very good relations with the Russians on most things. Uh, when it came to the war on terrorism, Russia was actually a very good partner because Russia has a terrorism problem of, of its own in the south of the country, as you well know. Uh, we did a lot of good work with Russia on the Middle East. Uh, Russia was actually very supportive of our negotiations with the Israelis and Palestinians. They were good on North Korea. Uh, they were more reserved on Iran, but they were better than advertised in their cooperation on Iran. The place that we got into trouble with the Russians, and it goes a little bit to the issue of the Soviet Union, is whenever we try to have a relationship with countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union or countries that were part of the Russian periphery, Georgia, Ukraine, the Central Asians, the Russians somehow felt that they had special privileges in those countries. And that's generally when we had trouble. So on missile defense, when we, had, um, when we decided to put interceptors um, in, uh, in uh, Poland and radars in the Czech Republic, uh, the Russians would say, put them in Turkey, we don't care. But the Czech Republic and Poland used to be members of the Warsaw Pact. So I actually think it's a little bit the other way around. I think the, the Russian leaders have sometimes had trouble letting go of what was the empire. Uh, Russia, though, is a different place today than it was. I was first in the Soviet Union in 1979. And let me tell you, this is not the Soviet Union uh, that you were, were living in. And so uh, Russia is a great culture, and my hope is that even with Vladimir Putin's decision to take the presidency again, um, we can start to see some progress toward a Russia that is more than an oil and gas uh, and minerals exporter uh, that begins to take advantage of its people power, which is really considerable. Thank when you. you. When you first visited the Soviet Union, 
Could you have imagined where they are today? Oh, no. Absolutely not. Because when I first visited the Soviet Union, I was 24 years old. I had never been outside of the United States except to skate in Canada. And I thought, what have I done? I could have studied Italy. <laughs> and I was just, I mean, the place was, it was actually a horrible place to be in those days. But uh, it has come a long way. The Russian people are accustomed to a great deal more of personal freedom, certainly personal prosperity. What has not kept pace is uh, democratic institutions uh, have largely been shut down by the current leadership. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go over here. There's a gentleman. Secretary, I have a question relating to your former nemesis, Putin. <laughs> you know, lately, as Putin is going to come back as president, the R Russian people are again talking about this he-man riding bareback on horses, harpooning whales, wrestling with tigers. So I was wondering that in the 1980s, I remember, when I was new in the US, Lee Iacocca, the corporate titan, reminded the world that the era of brawn and muscle is over, the era of the uh, brain yeah. has come. Yes. Is there something primitive about the Russian yeah. zeitgeist yeah. and the leadership that they are so relishing this brawny, muscular yeah. man compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, it's, a, it's an you. interesting question. You know, I actually think that the, um, first of all, Vladimir Putin, l let me tell you why he's popular in some quarters, right? When the Soviet Union collapsed, we saw the end of communism, the beginning of capitalism, Boris Yeltsin democracy. For the Russian people, I went there a lot in those early years of the 90s. For the Russian people, it was deprivation, humiliation, and want and poverty. Old ladies trying to sell a teacup on the, uh, on the old Arbat. Soldiers who didn't have a place to go back to. Drive-by shootings on Tverskaya. Putin comes and he says, I will give you order, prosperity, and respect. And he does to a certain extent, largely on the high price of oil, but he does. That's why he's been popular. Now, I do think there's a little bit of a backlash against the once and future president thing. You know, not even sort of paying homage to the fact that they have to go to an election, sort of saying he thinks he wants to be president again has not been popular. And I also think the he-man thing is actually uh, rubbing a little thin. Uh, there, he, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, there was a story of him diving into, I think it was the, the Moscow River, maybe the Nieva, and coming up with some antiquity that had been buried for whatever. <laughs> and, you know, the, the press didn't buy it, right? So they said, oh, come on, you put that there. And, and that's a good sign <laughs> in Russia when people can question. But the gentleman has a particularly important point. The Russians are among the world's most brilliant mathematicians and software engineers. The only problem is they're all working in Palo Alto and Tel Aviv. And that is because the system doesn't permit creativity to flourish in terms of human potential. Dmitry Medvedev has said Russia shouldn't just be an extractive industries uh, country. It should be creative and innovative. They've got work to do. Mm -hmm. Next question, we're going to the young lady over here. Hi, Dr. Rice. My name is Georgia Lagutis, and thank you very much for joining us at Rice University today. I had a question about relating to students and leadership. As there are many young students in the crowd and aspiring leaders, I'd like to ask your perspective on how do you define leadership, and when was the moment you first realized you had become a leader yourself? Well, thank you. Well, the definition of uh, leadership, uh, to my mind, is to be able to inspire people toward a common goal and then get them there. Right? So I've never liked the division of leadership and management because leaders have to inspire, but somebody has to manage getting them there. And so if people can understand that you have a vision and you know how to get them there, you're the very best of, of leaders. Leaders also have to have integrity if you ever find yourself asking people to do something you wouldn't do, you've got a problem. And most importantly, leaders have to be optimistic people. I mean, you have to be an optimist. Who wants to follow a down in the mouth, everything's going wrong, pessimist every day? People will shut you out if you don't show them that things can and will get better, not in a rose-colored glasses way, but in a way of we can get through this. 
And there's one other thing, you know, you can't have your hair on fire all the time, right? If you're running around in bad times, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, this is, so will everybody around you. And so I think those are the characteristics. Now, I think I first realized that I'd been thrust into a real position of leadership with the authority uh, to go with it when um, I suddenly found myself as the White House Soviet specialist on the German, unifi or the, the, the White House representative on the German unification delegation. Because I'm a, a student of international history. German unification, this is a big deal. Right? So this was really going to matter. This was the end game of the Cold War. Uh, we couldn't all of a sudden, after being this close to winning the Cold War, we couldn't lose it now. And I suddenly realized that I had to somehow motivate others in government to pull together toward workable policies for our bosses. And I thought, oh, I guess this is now a position of leadership. And I'm glad that I had a chance to do that. I then went on to become uh, Stanford's provost. And um, that, that's a position of leadership, too, of sorts, although since faculty don't particularly like to be led, <laughs> uh, it's a different kind of leadership. It comes with a lot of persuasion. When I was about to be named provost, I was 38 years old. I'd never been a department chair even. Either, uh, even. And so we were writing the press release, and the um, public relations guy said, we're going to emphasize the fact that you, after all, dealt with U.S.-Soviet relations, because I didn't really have credentials to be provost. <laughs> I said, you know what? I said, that's true, but Gorbachev didn't have tenure. And so <laughs> recognizing your constituency is also an important part of leadership. Back over in that corner. Uh, Dr. Weiss, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Julian Yao. I'm studying political science. I'm a junior at um, Rice. Um, in light of, recent, of the recent death of Colonel Gaddafi um, in Libya, there have been resurfacing, uh, resurfacing questions and uh, stories regarding his, shall we say, crush um, <laughs> on you. Um, and this is a really honest question. I just want to understand, as the Secretary of State of the United States of America, how do you deal with um, leaders around the, country, uh, in, around the world who are unorthodox, and how did you deal yeah, with that? Yeah, and that's a really nice way to put it, about unorthodox. <laughs> Uh, look, let, let me just give you the story because I know everybody really wants to, to, to know that story. Um, I knew before I went to Libya that uh, Gaddafi had a certain uh, creepy fascination with me. Um, a, couple of, a couple of foreign minister colleagues had told me, uh, my Africanist, the woman who did Africa for me, had learned it from others. And I had to go there because he'd given up his weapons of mass destruction. He had paid reparations to the victims of Pan Am 102. It was time to open relations with Libya. I said, okay, just go there, do your diplomatic thing, and get out, all right? And the planning for the trip had been a little bit difficult because he had told uh, my people, or his people had told my people, that he wanted to meet in his tent. And I said, ah, uh, no, <laughs> I don't think so. So we met in his living room, and uh, it was actually, for Gaddafi, a fairly normal <laughs> diplomatic encounter. And I had real business to do there. I needed to get supply routes open through Libya for refugees and humanitarian relief in Sudan, and so we did all of that. And then we went to dinner, and he said, at the end of dinner, he said, I have a video for you. And I thought, oh no, what is this? <laughs> And it was a perfectly innocent video of me with Hu Jintao, me with Vladimir Putin, me with Sarkozy, all set to music that he had had specially written by a Libyan composer called Black Flower in the White House. <laughs> so, so yes, it was completely bizarre, but I did what I had to do. And you know, I'm very glad that, um, that he's gone. The Libyan people have a chance. I'm also really glad that we had taken away his most, uh, most dangerous weapons before he was in that bunker, because I have no doubt that he, uh, that he would have used them. Is it hard when you have met someone, know someone in the way that you knew him, <laughs> 
And then you see what happens <laughs> on the news. Well, I mean, the personal relationship yeah, right, you right, build right, right. No, with I these leaders all over. I know over. what you mean, yeah. How do you process what you see then? You know, in the case of Gaddafi, I, I told everybody, I said, you know, um, he'll go down fighting somehow or, or he'll be killed. There's, there's no way he's going to run. Uh, it just, what, and I figured he would be in his hometown. That made sense to me among his tribe. Uh, but Gaddafi was a monstrous leader, um, and the Libyan people are lucky to be rid of him. Uh, there were people uh, for whom their assassination and their deaths, I had a very emotional reaction. When, uh, when Ariel Sharon um, had his stroke, um, and in effect has been brain dead for, for some time, uh, that really tugged at me, because I quite liked him. I, he was a little tough tank, tank driver, but he begun to see that the Palestinians had to have their own state. He'd withdrawn from Gaza. He was doing important things. I thought we had a chance with him to solve the Middle East peace problem because he had the legitimacy to take tough decisions because he was part of Israel's warrior generation. He'd been a tough guy. If he could make, you know, Nixon to China, if he could make the leap, then we had a real chance. That really hit me hard when that happened to him. Uh, so sometimes uh, it, it did. Uh, but yeah. not with Gaddafi. Okay. <laughs> Where are we going now? Back over to this corner. Uh, Dr. Rice, my name is Vivek Kavadi, and thank you for joining us tonight. You were both a national security advisor and a secretary of state, so you, you saw things from, from two different angles. I was wondering if you would comment on how we as global citizens, and in the United States in particular, deal with state-sponsored use of terror to achieve foreign policy goals rather than conventional war. It, it seems like that is going to be the future for us over the next quarter century. It's a very uh, insightful point. In fact, uh, state sponsorship of terrorism is, uh, terrorism is a problem, right? Stateless networks that, but if they can use either, can use the assets of the state, whether it's uh, financial assets of the state or the territory of the state as they were using in Afghanistan, if they can use, be used as extensions of the state as the Iranians do with Hezbollah or with that really bad Hamas uh, group in Gaza, uh, you really have a much more potent force. And if you think about a state sponsor of terrorism and all of those assets that might in fact also have a weapon of mass destruction, which is what makes Iran so dangerous, now you have the most dangerous uh, combination that one can imagine. And so our way of dealing this, with this was to put state sponsors of terrorism on notice that if you uh, harbor a terrorist or you support a terrorist, then we will treat you like a terrorist. Because one problem you have with terrorists is they don't really have any territory, nothing that you can deter them with. A state sponsor has, terrorism, uh, has territory, has uh, assets, has uh, a population, and so forth that it's, that it's trying to, uh, to uh, rule. So it's a very difficult problem, but I think the best thing that you can do is to identify it and to let the state sponsor know that uh, they are going to be treated uh, like the terrorist, meaning that they're not off the hook uh, for saying that uh, these are, you know, they're not using our territory. You know that they're using their territory. Put them on notice. Okay, way in the back corner over there now. Hello, Ms. Rice. My name is Andrea Pinto, and I'm a sophomore here at Rice. And from hearing you speak, I'm just really glad to be here. So thank, thank you, you for coming. And from hearing you speak, it sounds like you didn't really plan your careers or your jobs, but like you let your passions find, like take you where you are and what jobs you've had. So as undergraduates developing our passions, and just when I get older, I just want a job where I wake up and I'm just like, oh, I can't believe I'm getting paid for this. Yes. So just what's your advice for us finding that job that is our passion? You just hit the nail on the head. The the People ask me all the time, how do I get to do what you do? And I say, you start out as a failed piano major, all right? <laughs> and uh, the, the fact is you can't plan every step in your life. And the one thing you should do while you're in college is find what you're passionate about. Not what job you want, not what career you want, but what will make you get up in the morning and want to go and do that. Now, if you don't find your passion, sometimes it'll find you. Um, you know, I was going to be a musician. I really did, at the end of my sophomore year in college, go to the Aspen Music Festival School. I met 12-year-olds who could play from sight everything it had taken me all year to learn. 
and I thought, I'm about to end up teaching 13-year-olds to murder Beethoven or playing at Nordstrom. Both fine careers, but not what I want to do. And so um, I started the search for the major in my junior year. State and local government, no. English literature, no. Wandered into a class in international politics taught by a Soviet specialist, a man named uh, Joseph Corbell, Madeleine Albright's father. And he opened up this world of Russia, the Soviet Union, and, and di diplomacy to me, and I thought, that's what I want to do. Now, why? there are two lessons in that. The first is, keep looking if you've not quite yet found it. You'll find it. Secondly, it might be something that if somebody looked at you, they would say, a black woman from Birmingham, Alabama wants to be a Soviet specialist? What's that about? <laughs> Don't let anybody define what your passion is because of what your gender is, what your color is, where you come from, whatever. Your passion is your passion. And then, if you're fortunate, your passion and your talents come together. And so this story, for me, uh, has a very happy ending on the other side, too, because you know that I went on to be National Security Advisor and Secretary of State, but when I was National Security Advisor, my secretary came in and she said, Yo-Yo Ma is on the phone for you. I said, you mean the cellist? And she said, yes. And indeed, the world's greatest cellist was on the phone for me. And when he'd been at Stanford performing, he'd said, you play the piano, don't you? Maybe we'll play sometime. And I thought, yeah, we'll jam, you and me. Sure we will. <laughs> uh, you know, I thought it was a throwaway line. So uh, when he said he was getting the National Medal of the Arts, and would I play with him, it was one of the great days of my life to play with him because I'd come full circle with my music. But you know what? I wasn't confused. I was not playing with Yo-Yo Ma because I was the world's greatest pianist. I was playing with Yo-Yo Ma because I was the national security advisor who could play the piano. I'd made a good decision to change my major. So keep looking and you'll find it. In that answer, in that answer, the one thing that sticks in my mind is when you get up in the morning, how early do you get up in the morning? Well, when I was in government, I got up at 4.30 because I had to be at my desk at 6.30. I had to exercise five first. I sleep in now to 5.15. Oh, well, you're just throwing <laughs> away your life. We have a question. I want to let you know we are very short on time, so the shorter the questions, the quicker we can go. Over to that gentleman with the red collar, it looks like. Uh, Dr. Rice, yeah, I was born in the Ukraine, but uh, I tell people I'm from Russia, and I wanted to know why the insistence from the U.S. Uh, to f support and finance all these nationalist movement, because even before the Soviet times, Ukraine was a part of Russia for 300 years. Yeah. Same with Kazakhstan, yeah. Uzbekistan, and the well, they were part. They were part of the Russian Empire, but empires break down, and people express their nationalism uh, in good ways and bad. I mean, the Ottoman Empire once uh, had lots of nationalities within it too. The Austro-Hungarian Empire actually had Czechs and Hungarians and, and uh, so forth. And so uh, I think that what you want to do is that you want to give people a chance to express themselves uh, in democratic institutions. And that really is what we had hoped for with the collapse of the Soviet Union. These became independent countries through processes that were actually in the Soviet Constitution. These countries left because they didn't see their identity as Russian. I understand the difference. Are you from Eastern Ukraine? Yes. Yeah. I understand the difference between Eastern Ukraine and Western Ukraine. Western Ukraine has always had a much stronger identity of being Ukrainian. Ukraine. And so I understand that there are a lot of tensions. But you know, the, the, the thing that I would like to say to all people who are in uh, the former Soviet Union is nationality within boundaries needs to matter less anyway. We are a very mobile human race now. People move around, they speak different languages, they study in different places. And I actually think the modern concept of citizenship is going to be one that is actually more like the American concept of citizenship, where you're not tied to territory or ethnicity for citizenship. So I hope that the day comes when Ukrainians living in Russia feel completely as confident as Georgians living in Ukraine. That's really the modern concept of citizenship, not that everybody's locked into boundaries based on nationality. Thank you. Thank you.
I am going to have to say we are running very tight on time. And there is a question they, they really want me to ask you before we let go. So folks in line, I don't think we're going to get Sorry. to your questions just to let you know. But there are many students here, hundreds of students with us right now, thousands watching us on TV. If they're considering a career in public service, what would you tell them? First of all, do it. Because uh, I named this book No Higher Honor because that's exactly how I feel. Public service is a very, very high honor. Uh, secondly, uh, try to find early opportunities to sort of test it out. Uh, I was actually an intern at the State Department in 1977, and I used to tell people when I go speak to interns, be good to your interns, you never know what might quite <laughs> happen. So there are many opportunities to take internships, to take fellowships, to go and work in public service while you're either still in college or just out of college. But most importantly, go and become good at something. If you're going to uh, go into business, go and be good at that. If you're going to go into law, go and be good at that. If you're going to become a specialist in Russian affairs, go and be good at that. And then you have something really to offer in public service. And one way that our system works that people sometimes don't like to hear it, it goes back to your first question about politics, is very often our public servants, people who go into the foreign policy uh, teams or people who end up assistant secretary or deputy secretary, deputy assistant secretary, are people who actually worked on campaigns. There's nothing wrong with finding a candidate that you like, and right now, a candidate that you like, and going and offering to start at the bottom, stuffing envelopes. And the next time around, maybe you'll write policy papers on something that you know. And the next time around, maybe you'll actually even be advising the candidate and you'll end up in government. But even if you don't do public service in government, do public service. And I have to say something very favorable about this generation of college students. I was 10 years uh, out of Stanford before going back in 2009. And I have to say that I think college students today are more public-minded than they have been in a long, maybe in my entire career. More of them going into Teach for America more of them going into the Peace Corps, more of them going into Global Health Corps, more of them wanting to do that kind of public service to look for something bigger than themselves. And that's a wonderful antidote to something that I think is really an affliction now in our society. You know, I said earlier that my parents told me, you may not be able to control your circumstances, but you can control your response to them. If you are constantly in a state of aggrievement about what you don't have. You then give way to aggrievement's twin brother, entitlement, why don't they give me? And now you've lost control, not just of your circumstances, but of your response to your circumstances. And the best antidote to doing that is going and working on behalf of somebody who has so much less than you do that you realize, how in the world could I possibly be aggrieved? And so public service is good because it's at the core of our democracy. We need public servants. But it's also good for the soul. And I would like to say, <laughs> on that note, thank you for all the service you have given us. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Condoleezza Rice. Thank you.